So the first first piece of equipment that we're going to look at is routers. And the thing that you want to really walk away with routers is regardless of their size, their cost, their complexity, all routers are just basically computers. That is not true of a switch. That's not true of many other devices. But of a router, they are just like a computer. They're going to have an operating system. Linux is very popular, but Cisco has their own unique proprietary <coughs> iOS. And they call it the iOS. It's a, I believe it's a Berkeley version of Unix. Juniper uses their, uh, their own uh, operating system. So it's going to have an operating system. Typically, it's either going to be a Unix variant or a Linux variant is the most popular operating systems. It's going to have a CPU. It's going to have RAM. It's going to have ROM. Now, the only unique feature of routers is they, they talk a lot about NVRAM. So when we talk about NVRAM, think of that as their hard drive. This is what they usually talk about. They'll, they'll say NVRAM a lot. And when we, whenever we're saying NVRAM, that is going to be really the router's hard drive. The diagram, when you look at a diagram with a router in it, that is the symbol. Now there's two players that determine network device symbols. That's Vizio, Microsoft's Vizio. Visio is a uh, template that designs logical diagrams. So Microsoft and Cisco really rule the symbol world. I mean, how do we, uh, what symbol represents a router? Uh, so when you see a network diagram and you see that symbol, you know it's a router. That is something you must start getting comfortable with. Uh, we, all, we also call it a default gateway. <clears throat> so here's a very complex network diagram, and we're expected as techs to understand the symbols of firewalls. This is a router, a 2500 router, Cisco router. This is a 7000 Cisco series router. And we're to understand how it works, how it functions. Routers are always between subnets. So Anytime you have a subnet here, you see a 28.59, 14.25, you see a different subnet over here, you must place a router between different subnets. So always recognize the symbols. This is something you need to start really picking up and understanding. When I see that symbol, that's a router. Anytime you have a subnet, you must bring a router. <coughs> At home, SOHO routers are the most common use uh, that we find in the home. But as we leave the home, we start getting into serious small business. You're going to see uh, routers like this. This is Cisco. Uh, HP sells them. Uh, tel uh, tr uh, TrendNet sells them. Many, many companies sell. The branch Dell has a whole line of small business routers for branch sites, so you'll see that change. Then you get into WANs, serious, serious routers, very, very large organizations. Uh, these are probably half a million dollars a pop, easily. Uh, a lot of companies sell that. Then we get into service providers, people like CenturyLink, Bright House, AT&T, Verizon. This is the kind of router they buy. Uh, these are probably a million dollars each uh, for one of these routers, and they are incredibly powerful. So routers are often called default gateways. This is an interesting thing. For whatever reason, the world of TCPIP always, always, always had a tendency to call these gateways. So when you use the language of TCPIP, it was always the gateway yet everybody else called it routers. So just understand, when we talk about routers, the same word is applied to default gateway. So anytime you say default gateway, you're talking the router. Here's an example of, T uh, I did an IP config of my PC at work, and you can see there's an area where you have the default gateway and you have an IP address. So even here in our IP config, instead of saying router, why not? We have to use the word default gateway. So this is a real, uh, 
it is because the language of IP, the language of TCPIP, that has always been the, the, the word that is used to the router. So the default gateway and the router's IP. Now, this is very important. All printer, all printers, all servers need to know the router's IP address. If you have a local area network and it, they want to leave the local area network, they must have the router IP. What are the two pieces of information we must have in order to work on a LAN only? What two pieces of IP information that we have to have in order to work on a LAN? If we want to leave the LAN and go to another subnet, we must have a gateway. But just to work on a LAN, what two IP bits of information must be? The subnet mask and? The IP address. So just local area network, you need the subnet mask and the IP address. If you want to leave that subnet and go somewhere else, you must have a default gateway. This is the inside of a typical router. Uh, let me just kind of show you around. This area here, let me, uh, man, I like my little laser pointer here. This area here is basically what we call interfaces. So let's say you're going to connect a DSL connection this card would be designated just to handle DSL and convert it into Ethernet or whatever uh, protocol you're going to do. So each of these cards in the front, and you can see it's got a big bay here, so you could have a fiber optics connector, and this card would handle that fiber optics. The one thing about routers, it's about interfaces, because routers connect to many kinds, T1, T3s, frame relay, uh, ASDL, DSL, all kinds of telecom uh, connections can come into your router. So a lot of real estate in a router is given to handling the different kinds. Is it a T1? I have to have a card for a T1. Is it a DSL? I have to have a card for a DSL. So a lot of the cost and a lot of the real estate of the inside of a router is designated for the interface for whatever you're going to put in. And all of these are swappable. So you can put in an Ethernet interface, a DSL interface, a frame relay, a fiber optic, whatever you want. They're very, very flexible. Any kind of telecom connection you can think of, you can put a card in here that will work with it. Okay. The rest of the inside of your, of your router is basically your CPUs, your RAM, your NVRAM, uh, your logic. Notice it's got a lot of DIMM sockets. And of course, you want to put memory in a Cisco router. Don't think for one minute. You can go to Best Buy. Of course not. You have to buy Cisco proprietary <coughs> DIMMs. You can't buy any old DIMMs. Uh, these run about, this is a branch office router, a 2500, 2600. They run about $2,300 plus the warranty and the support. So you can pay another $300 a year for support. So they're very expensive. I've seen branch offices where a business is buying one of these when they could have easily gotten something much less expensive and it would have done them fine. So make sure you know what you're doing uh, before you let a salesperson sell something. These routers are often found in T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, Sprint. They use the kind, these kind of routers. These are serious, serious routers. They are first class. They're amazing. They just, I mean, just going near them. Is... <clears throat> now listen very carefully. I'm going to talk about this. For the exam, you need to know routers work at what layer? They work at layer three, but technically routers work at layer one, layer two, and layer three. But the answers to the questions when we talk about routers is they are layer three. They are slower and more expensive because of the decisions and routing that has to be done. Let me give you an example. Bright House, if you bring 100 megabits per second, Bright House connection, your home router has to inspect and route.
between 1,500 packets per second and 100,000 packets per second. This takes a tremendous amount of computational power. If you go to Cisco's site, and I've got a link here, you can go get, I'll show you where all of this, the PowerPoint, the study guide, and all this is at. If you go to that link, it actually takes you to a chart and shows you how, for every bits per second that you have connected uh, to your home, it shows you how many packets per second your router must uh, route and make determination on. It is not easy. So here's, if you go to Bright House, it costs you $92 a month to get 100 megabits. But you better make sure your router can handle over 100,000 packets per second. Because that's what it's going to have to do. So a lot of times people think, I'm going to buy a faster bandwidth connection via Bright House, and I have a junky little router sitting in there, and that's going to handle it. If you, if you use right, if you use their router, which I don't, uh, I just mm -hmm. say bring me a network connection. Uh, if you use their router, they have to upgrade that router. Yeah, they have to. So let's take a look. Oops, this is the kind of action that takes place inside your router. If you're thinking your router is simple, look over here. We got incoming packets. You have a packet buffer. You have logic that has to be that has to open the packet, it has to look at the packet, it has to look at the destination IP, it has to go through a series of firewalls, NAT, then it goes out of the, out of the control plane of the router and then out the interface. All of this takes time. A router has to do pretty intensive packet inspection. Pretty intensive packet inspection. And because of that, it's time consuming and complex. Don't think that routers are simple. They're not. They're very complex. When you take a ISP router like this one, each of these connections is our gigabit. Some of them are 10 gigabit. So every one of these connections you see on these bus bars, you see these uh, large uh, slide-in racks that go in. Each connection is probably a gig or 10 gig. This is typically what you'll see in Tampa and Miami in the uh, internet connection point. If you have a gigabit connection, that router has to route between 1 million packets per second and 10 million packets per second. It has to open them up, inspect them, find the destination IP, look at the rules that are set up in the router, Make a look at the routing table and send that off in the right direction. That's why they're going to pay a million dollars for one of them, just for the computational power to do. It's quite amazing. So in reality, the answer to the question, what layer does the router work at? It works at layer three or the network layer, but in reality, it really works at all three. Let's take a look. So notice that IP6 and IP4 are at the network layer. Let's take a look at an animation here. Let's see if I can get this to go. Playing with all kinds of cool toys. So here you can actually see the packet coming down the stack and the movie is not that great. But what I do, I was hoping for better quality than that. All right, I want you to look right here. Let me get my laser pointer. My video did not turn out well. This is the router right here. This is a router. Notice that it's basically going to work at layer what? Three. Layer three. But it does have a data link layer, and it does have a physical layer. And to leave the router, of course, you're going to have a data link layer and a physical layer. So routers, in the reality, have all three layers. In the questions that they're going to ask you in CompTIA, it's going to be layer three. All right, let's talk about switches. Now you're going to be expected to explain the function and application of switches. Most of you are starting to get a little bit comfortable with switches. Uh, the symbol for the network diagram, this is the symbol that you'll see. It's a layer one, layer two device, but remember that's the actual technical. It works at layer one and layer two. You're plugging a cable into that switch port. It's layer one and layer two. The questions that you're going to be asked on the CompTIA, when they say, what layer does a switch work, you're going to say? Two. 
Layer two. So when do we go to a bowl with layers here to the highest? I'm sorry? When do we go to like layers, do you always go to the highest uh, that they go to? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Um, they, they always talk about layer two. So just, you're safe if you say layer two. But you can see this particular switch is always going to have cables and you're going to see a data link layer and the physical layer. If you look carefully at the standard, let me see if I can get this. Notice the standard here, 802.2 and 802.3. Remember, listen carefully, 802.3 is wired Ethernet. 802.11 is wireless. And remember, there are other standards that, that cover fiber. So if it's 802.3, that is wired Ethernet. 802.11 is, is wireless. This is a symbol for the Ethernet switch. You really need to get comfortable with this. Here you can see a switch. That's not a hub. That's a switch. And then the router symbols. Be able to read network diagrams. Make sure that when you see the symbols, you understand what that is. Switches are incredibly fast and expensive. They are the heart of a local area network. If I could get you guys to walk over with anything, it's when we say a switch, you're talking your land. That is your local area network. So if I say, show me your local area network, you would take me to your network closet. And that's where your switches are, because that's your LAN. Your wires just simply get the user connected back to the, to the switch. That is very, very important that you pick that up. Switches make decisions on MAC addresses. Here's something very interesting. None of your local area network traffic ever uses IP. None of your local area network traffic ever uses IP. Why? Because switches don't care about IP. Is there a single switch that cares about IP? No. All of your local area network traffic. Think about it. Every, you know, everything we, we focus on IP and TCP IP, and, but all of your traffic on this local area network at Winter Park Tech, all your traffic is strictly MAC address. It isn't until it hits that router and you decide to leave this network, Winter Park Tech's network, that it finally worries about IP address. Everything else is what? It's MAC. It's totally MAC. We're not talking about Apple. <coughs> All right, <clears throat> so here's IP config. You can see here's your physical address. They also call MAC a physical address. <clears throat> and notice some vendors use the physical address with a dash between the eight bits, and some vendors use what? Come on, Tex. The colon. The, uh, colons, yeah. Oh. So some vendors will use colons between the eight bits. Other vendors, Microsoft obviously uses a dash. Don't get confused, they're the same thing. On the back of a small home router, that's the switch. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a bad boy, I'll tell you what, that's a beautiful switch. So this portion right here is your switch. You have a switch. And it's very important that when you look at these multifunction devices, you can identify what's the switch, what's the WAN connection, what's the router, what's the... All right. <clears throat> so these typically run about $3,000 to $4,000 for 48-port switch. They're pretty expensive. Most of them, Cisco, HP, these are the big ones. Dell is a big player. In fact, these are the three big players in switches, Cisco, Dell, and HP. Uh, I would say that HP and Dell are eating into the Cisco business. Cisco used to own the switch market, but that is being changed by the competitors of Dell, bringing really good products and good, great prices. HP is very competitive in the switch market. These, these two guys are eating into Cisco's share of the switch market. Juniper is very, very big in high-end, high-performance 
Uh, brocade is getting into switches. They do a lot of fiber channel. They were very big in fiber channel. Remember, your LAN is your switches. So when we talk about switches, that is your local area network. Uh, many, many vendors play in this market. You can go out there and buy some really good stuff out there that's fantastic. And it does not have to be Cisco. So don't think that your switch world has to be a Cisco device. They're very complex. Uh, I highly recommend you, uh, if you look at, like here is a integrated ASCII chip. These are ASCII chips designed by major, major silicone companies who design the switch fabric. These are so complex. It's just mind-boggling, the complexity. We've talked about switch fabric and arbitration and fabric that makes a switch work is incredibly complex. As a tech, we're going to learn the basic configuration troubleshooting of switch ports. But please do not think the switches are simple. They really, really are not. So here is Brocade. You can see Brocade is a major manufacturer of silicon. So they do, they're actually the people that do a lot of the uh, silicon that is necessary uh, to make the, the switch fabric. Here you see they also do the, the front end chips. All these chips here in the front are done by Brocade. So they're a major player in making the chips themselves. If you want an interesting study, go to Brocade's website and look up these chips. It really gives you an insight to how complex a switch really is. Now the next, next piece of equipment that you have to know is a multi-layer switch. A multi-layer switch is just a switch with router. So you put a router in a switch and it's called a layer 3 switch or a multi-layer switch. This is the symbol for your multi-layer switch. So be aware, uh, this is a symbol that indicates a multi-layer switch. Basically, you got uh, a switch and a router. They're very popular. Uh, you, don't buy, you don't have to have everything with a layer 3 capability, but generally, uh, one of your most critical switches in your company is going to be a layer 3. So you can see they come in all sizes. Juniper has them in a 1U rack. You see a very small one here for a small office. You see a package here with another company. So they come in all shapes and sizes. Basically, it's layer 2 and layer 3. Here's another company that works with layer 3 switches. So they, they don't think that Cisco is the only company. A lot of times you get, you get stuck with Cisco, HP, Dell, uh, Juniper, Cisco. All of them are big players. But look at all these off-brands. Let me explain something that happens. You really want to pay attention. Every year, there's a new startup company, and they come out with an uh, outrageously new, innovative product. If they do well, they, they're not a startup anymore. Why? What happens? Because we're an actual company. What happens with this innovative startup that comes out with this phenomenal idea for a switch, or comes out with this phenomenal concept for a load balancer? Uh, they're not a startup very long. What happens to them? They get bought. Cisco goes and absorbs them. <laughs> HP goes out and buys them. So what happens is the innovation happens with little bitty companies. Five or six guys come out of MIT and they come up with this fantastic uh, innovative idea. And they'll have a little startup company. They'll sell a, a no-name brand. But everybody is buying it because it's so awesome. And then six months later, what do you see? No. In the business news, Cisco just acquired Empty Scratch, and now the president of that startup is sitting on the Bahama beach, uh, <laughs> sipping uh, pina coladas and enjoying life, okay? Nice. That's what these guys do, is a lot of, they come, the innovation is not out of Cisco. The innovation is not out of Dell a lot of times. It's little small companies that come up with fantastic ideas and they'll market it, they'll do well, and then they're... So watch for that. A lot of times the most innovative companies are, are the ones that are cutting edge and bringing the hottest technologies. It is not Dell and HP that's doing it. It's these little small companies. So you'll see these no-name brands and you'll wonder, 
What brand is that? But when you go look at the specs, it's blowing everybody out the door. Cisco doesn't have anything like it. HP doesn't have anything like it. And then six months down the road, in the business journal, you see that HP has just acquired, and then they absorb that product in. Multi-layer switches typically, now listen carefully in your notes, it does not mean they will not work at other layers. You can buy a multi-layered switch that works at other layers, but predominantly it's going to be layer 2 and layer 3. Okay, Predominantly layer 2 and layer 3. There are switches that work at higher levels. So it is absolutely not, you know, you, it's not that you can't have it, but it's, it is possible. This is right out of your curriculum. This is your host. This is your host. You'll notice you've got your data that goes down. In fact, let's go take a look. Let's see how my video turned out. We'll give it a shot here. This is my Mr. V's demo. There we go. All right. Now notice, as we get to layer four, we get encapsulated, and it becomes a what? Segment. segment. Then it goes into layer three, it becomes a? Yeah. Then it goes into layer two, and it becomes a? Frame. frame. You must know that. And it goes into the routing, comes back up as a frame, then a packet, then a segment, segment and then throughout the rest of the layer, it's data. Now, my question to you is this. What's above layer 7? What's above layer 7? The user. <laughs> no. What's above layer 7? Level 8. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well you can count. That's really good. Uh, what's above layer 7? So what's above layer 7? Let's go take a look. Because you need to know this. This is, this is really, 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 really... We just saw the, the stack. Here were two hosts. And we saw, we saw the OSI layer. Yes? Above each one of these hosts is your OS, your operating system. And then above this is your user space. So this would be where your applications would be, your Word, your browser, yes? So right above layer 7 is really your operating system. So your, as your application makes a call to the network, it can call directly down to the network stack. Or it could be a function of the operating system that makes a call down to the network stack. But the next layer above your TCP IP is your operating system. Then above your operating system is your applications, your services, all the things that your user. So don't forget the big picture. That's what is above layer 7. Firewalls. Firewalls, we're going to find, are very, very interesting. Firewalls, on an enterprise firewall, we're going to be looking at all seven layers. Enterprise firewalls, we're going to look at all seven layers. Now, in the PowerPoints, I want you to notice something. I keep showing the OSI layer, and I keep showing you different variations of the same graphic because I am showing you what do you need to know at the application layer. What is happening at the presentation layer? What is happening at the session layer? So I deliberately chose many, many different OSI layer model pictures because each of them help you to better understand each layer. So make sure you look at these pictures because they all, for example, layer 7 is network process to application. This is where DNS, www, HTTP, email, POP, SMTP, Telnet, FTP. At layer 6, you don't hear a lot about this, but this is where MP3s, AVIs, JPEGs, docs, because there's where we're dealing with data, presentation, and encryption. 
So look at these pictures. I deliberately chose them because they're rich with different information about the OSI layer and what goes on. This is a great picture because it gives you so much information about what the layer does and the different kinds of protocols that are in, in those layers. So when you get a chance, look at, again at these slides. Or watch the 4K movie. The symbol for firewall is going to be this, It'll, and this is the key. This took me years to figure out. I, I, I have to tell you, I did not get this. But this was so simple, it, it took me a long time. But I finally got it. Firewalls allow all traffic that originates within the what? Land. All traffic that originates in the land. Firewalls stop all traffic that does not originate within the land. That's what a firewall does. So if it's, if it's unsolicited traffic, if it's the, um, someone's knocking on your apartment doors trying to sell you a water softener, that's unsolicited salespeople. It blocks them. It doesn't allow unsolicited. Different kinds of firewall. Your home firewalls are called SPIs, and we'll get into that. Home firewalls only inspect layer three and four. So your little router at home has a firewall, but it only looks at three and four. When we get into OCPS, they have a firewall that looks layer two through seven. So we're going to look at everything, everything. We're going to inspect that packet. Because firewalls inspect, inspect packets, they're expensive and require computational power to be effective. The more your bandwidth, the more expensive the firewall. At home, you have what's called a stateful packet inspection firewall. It looks at layer three and layer four, that's it. That's all your little home router does. But that will not work in a business. In a business, we've got to look at all kinds of traffic. It's much more complex. We got to look at what is Brianna doing? She's on Facebook. She's on Skype. She's on who knows. We have to look at all of that and then decide does it meet the rules, the company policies, and anything else that you put in your firewall? If it doesn't, then you shut it down. They are fast, they're expensive, and complex to set up. I've had guys tell me out in the field that to set up some of these firewalls, you it literally took an engineering degree. They're extremely complex. I think the biggest problem with firewalls is their complexity set up. They're nuts. That's one of their disadvantages is that they're complex. This is an example of a HP firewall. You'll notice it's interesting. It's got a slot card in the front. It's got a USB for interface, and how many jacks do you see? Two. One of those two jacks. One, four, and one. In and out, that's it. So you have your WAN connection. What happens is you bring your WAN in one connection, and your WAN goes out the other, and everything inside goes through that firewall system. That's it. So many times a firewall is two ports. That's it. WAN input, WAN output, and it has to go through that firewall. So it goes before or after the router? That's a great question. That question is probably dependent on the device. Some devices, I would say before the router. I, I won't, so I won't stick to that hard, but I would say most of them are going to be before the, the actual edge router. If your ISP brings you Ethernet, for example, a Bright House connection is Ethernet, you can plug it right in, so you don't need a router. Then this could go out into your router. If you have a frame relay situation, then you'll probably have to put it after the router, okay? But if you have an Ethernet input from your ISP, you could bring it right in here, out, right into your router. So depending on the kind of interface. Who, who makes firewalls? Dell. Dell bought SonicWall, and they are a major, major vendor in firewalls. SonicWall is a big name. HP uh, has them, Cisco has them. 
There's lots of those little, remember those little companies I tell you? They come out with some of the most fantastic intrusion detection, firewall technology, and they're quickly absorbed. I mean, they're out for like two years and they're gone. So a lot of these big guys uh, just absorb these small vendors. This is an enterprise firewall. You can see it's very, very complex. And think of it. Think of the firewall that we use at OCPS. We have over 300 gigabyte connection. So this firewall has to be able to read 300 gigabits per second, inspect all the stuff those school kids are doing, and decide what goes through and what doesn't. Tell me the computational power of that firewall. Big. You know what a lot of companies are doing now? Is they're take because this requires so much computational power, they're sending the WAN connection through a cloud provider. They're sending you into a database a, um, a data center. You're going through multiple servers at the same time because that's the only way they can do it. And then you're going out the data center. And the data center is your is your firewall. Because a data center can hold so many servers, and all those servers can handle that traffic at the same time, one appliance, one box cannot do that. This has got so much bandwidth and so much rules and policies to check, one device can't do it. 300 gigabits? Think about it. 300 gigabits. So one device can't do it. So what they're doing is they're piping your WAN into this big data center with racks and racks of servers that are doing 300 gigabits all at one time. Parallel processing. So here's a firewall. I don't know what that cost, but it looks expensive. I mean, it just, it just looks expensive. That's a serious piece of equipment. So that's an HP version of a firewall. This was very interesting. It's a subject on the Compte objective, and I didn't find a whole lot of information on it. It's called Host-Based Intrusion Detection Systems. It's a software-based security system that installs on PCs and servers. Listen carefully. It monitors and analyzes the internals of the computing system as well as network packets on its interface. It's much more complex than an antivirus. So let's look at HIDS. This is a CompTIA objective. Uh, why do you need HIDS? I went to a vendor site and here's what they said. Hackers can get through your firewalls. Network intrusion cannot stop encrypted malicious traffic. Why, ID, why HIDS? Antivirus services will stop, but not all viruses. Internal servers and databases are vulnerable to new and unknown type of attack. And the system protect these critical needs to be constantly learning and reviewed by security. So one of the reasons why companies who sell HIDS say, you need us, is because of these reasons. Let's go take a look at it. Here's some of the companies that sell HIDS. I found that most of these companies sell to Linux farms. I was very surprised. When I went out there, I saw almost zero, zero Windows-centric HIDS. Almost all of them were based on Linux and for Linux. So, because Linux is very vulnerable to hacking, uh, Alien Vault, OSSEC, which is an open source uh, HIDS um, system, Atomic Secured, all of them were there to provide this very comprehensive security for Linux servers. So if you've got Linux servers running Apache and they're your website, uh, a lot of companies were going to this, this, this method um, for secure protection. HIDS, you can take a look. It has event correlation, intelligent log, built-in vulnerability scanner. Look at how much, um, this goes way beyond antivirus. So the software though, right? It is software that installs on the Linux server. 
uh, virtual patching, zero-day protection, brute force protection, compliance monitoring, self-healing, real-time anti-spam, um, automatic uh, redation, secure and hardened kernel, stack and heat protection. So this is a very, very comprehensive uh, way of protecting. And what I was surprised, I didn't find a single Windows vendor for HIDS. They were all Linux. Who's the most on the internet? Linux. Now the next topic that you have to study for uh